But if you don't know what's there foundationally, you're kind of, you can get to that situation where you're chasing your tail a bit. Or you're relying on what, you know, three well, different experts saying four different things. Yes. What, which, what, which one do you follow? And, yeah. And so this is really hoping to empower our readers to become their own expert. Hi, everyone. It's Judy Warner. Welcome back to another On Track podcast. Thanks for joining us this week. Well, we have one of your favorite backs today, Dr. Eric Bogatin, who has come out with a new book that I thought you'd want to know about, and then another one that he published, I believe, last year. So he's here to tell us about that and just update us on what he's been up to. So lean in, enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for joining us again. It's been a long time and it's good to see you. Hey, Judy. Always a pleasure to be on your podcast. Yes, it's always a pleasure to have you. So I was talking to the fine folks at our tech house, which is a, a technical book publishing house out of Boston. And they were telling me that you've got a new book out. Um, but before we start getting into all that, I want to know what's up with the amazing background. You have this <laughs> nebula, like what's the story? You always have the best backgrounds. Yeah. So, so this one here, this is one of Hubble's greatest hits. This is, um, actually a supernova remnant. It was, uh, um, I think there've been about three or four supernovas that have been visible from the earth in recorded time. This one happened 1055 AD, recorded by the Chinese and also by the American Indians. Um, and it, it appeared as a bright star during the day. It was so bright. And, and so after it exploded, it left behind a neutron star. You can't see it, but it's in the very center there. Um, and that neutron star is, um, uh, uh, it's pulsing away at 33 times a second or so and, uh, and is a really spectacular um, uh, structure to observe. Um, and so this is the Crab Nebula and um, uh, it's one of the uh, 110 objects that Charles Messier, Messier uh, discovered in the late 1800s. It's amazing that we've been observing things in the sky for that long. Uh, you know, the the sky, especially, you know, the lunar cycles and, and sun, sun cycles tied to the seasons, uh, it has been ever since we started agriculture, the seasons have been an important part of uh, uh, of human culture. And so it's just evolved over time. And, 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 and um, you know, the in in um, Charles Messier's time, uh, comets were really um, uh, a really big thing. They were, you know, wanderers in the solar, they're transient objects. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of mystical um, uh, connotation. And, and, and there was quite a, a, a thing to be a comet hunter, to look for comets and be the first one to discover it. And Charles Messier uh, was, was one of the most fervent comet hunters. He had a small little four inch telescope and would scan the sky looking for a little fuzzy object that moved across the sky. And he found all of these fuzzy little objects, but they didn't move. And so he started making a recording and a listing of them. He said, don't go here. There's nothing to see. It's not a comet. <laughs> Ignore this fuzzy little, little uh, dot in the sky. Go look for another one that's moving. And, and he recorded 110 of these fuzzy objects. They're called Messier objects. And they have turned out to be the most interesting objects in the sky. Even though they don't move, they are all either galaxies, nebula, uh, uh, or, uh, or in this case, supernova remnants, planetary nebula. Uh, and they all, as amateur astronomers, they are the very first thing you want to go look at because they're so interesting. And it turns out they were the in the discard bin of uh, Charles Messier saying, nothing to see here. Just move on to something else where you might see a real comet. That's comic. so great. And yeah, so, so that photo is from the Hubble? because it's is a, a Hubble shot, yeah. That is spectacular. 
Yeah. So I, I always like to have a theme with my, we do Zoom at CU with my students and I always like to have a theme. Last semester was um, 1950s science fiction posters. Yes. And, um, and the last theme I've been using is uh, Hubble's Greatest Hits. Well, it makes for awesome background. I love it. And a good conversation piece, right? Yeah, they, they, they are the most interesting, the, the uh, messy objects, most interesting objects in the, in the sky. And they all tell a story. They all tell something about stellar evolution and about how um, astrophysics works. So that makes them even you know, beautiful to look at and having a compelling uh, physics story behind them as well. So for our listeners, if you don't know Dr. Eric Bogatin or you live under a rock, he uh, does have a PhD in, in physics, right? That's yep. your, your PhD is in physics. And, um, and I actually also- worked in my thesis was in cosmology. And so, oh, I don't know yeah. that I knew that about you. Yeah, yeah, I did uh, desktop cosmology experiments, and um, and so I've always been interested in astrophysics and cosmology, and and you can't make money at it, uh, but you can have a lot of fun with it. Well, you've also, of course, are a, a professor, full time professor now at um, CU Boulder, the Colorado University of Boulder, and you're teaching. You're really equipping young. Um, engineers to do amazing things from and very practically right in a real, real world s- scenario but you can do all the math to behind it which is really impressive and then you're always fun to listen to so um that's why you've been so popular with the altium community so um okay so let's talk about your book so right along those lines yeah. you have two books that came out um, from our tech one, I think we talked about last year, I'm going to pull up the titles because you have a habit of having these long titles that <laughs> Judy struggles with, but I, they're great. Yeah. The title is the, the first chapter of the book, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Okay. So yeah. the first one that we talked about, I think last year was Bogotin's practical guide to transmission line design and characterization for signal integrity applications chapter two (laughs) (laughs) so tell us uh give our audience a refresher on that book and then we'll talk about the the latest one that's on pre-order now so um so so i've i've been working with uh, our tech uh for a number of years and we decided on a series of books all with the starting title of Bogotin's Practical Guide to something. And so the first one in the series is what I think is really at the foundation of all signal integrity, and that is uh, transmission line structures. And so um, I wrote this book, and the other key feature working with Artec and why I went to Artec is uh, I wanted these to be multimedia. Um, and so, yeah, you can get the, the original ideas come out with just the soft copy uh, mm-hmm. because I have embedded videos so throughout the, the book, there are places where I thought, hey, this would be really good to explain this in person or to show measurement or how to use a tool. And so we have video recordings that are you know, typically two to five minutes long each um, sprinkled throughout the book. And so in the soft copy, it's a link. You just click on it and then the video appears and you, you, play, you have to be obviously online and, and it appears. Um, there was so much, and the idea was, it's just going to be a soft copy. That's all because it's multimedia. And there was so much interest, mostly from us old guys, old folks, yep. to, to have a hard copy book yep. that um, our tech went ahead and they, and they did a print version of it. And so obviously in the print version, there's nothing to click on. Right. Uh, so you can't see the video, but you can hold that book in your hand as, as a hard copy. So there's the hard copy and then the print version, and then you can get a a bundle from our tech. So you get both of them, the, the best of both worlds. Oh, there you go. So um, you can access and on the print version, Eric, does it give you the URL so you could manually look it up or how do they bridge no. that? Yeah. Nope. The way you bridge that is you, you get the bundle and then you can have the soft I copy see. and click on the soft copy. Okay. Well, that's easy though, that you could just click yeah. the link. So, yeah. And, okay. and I really wrote it with the intent that this is the first in our series that everything about signal integrity, almost everything about signal integrity, it involves transmission lines and the concepts. And it's something that if it's taught at all in schools, it's taught from an RF perspective and you get this 
um, long you know, had to solve a differential equation to end up with you know with with this uh, uh, parameter of the impedance looking in the front of the transmission line based on the characteristic impedance of the line and the tangent of the length and angle and and it's really complicated hard to understand applies to the frequency domain and there's nothing about it that a signal integrity engineer can use and mm. so where this topic is taught in a lot of schools you walk away without a whole lot of understanding of okay what's mm. the transmission line and and i literally i teach um uh, some some signal integrity class here at cu and we have a very um extensive rf curriculum i get students that have gone through the rf program the graduate students and the very first day you know i ask them what's the transmission line they can't tell me what a transmission line is and so wow. we wrote this book really as the foundation building book about how to think about transmission lines and how signals propagate on transmission lines what the important properties are and knowing that how do we engineer how do we design the transmission lines for the properties that we want and then how do you measure them and so there's quite a lot about using a tdr and interpreting the results and about single ended and differential transmission lines as well so it's like you know, the title says it's a very practical guide to understanding what i think is the principles the design best design practices best simulation practices, best measurement practices for transmission lines. Well, one thing that I think most people appreciate about you is that you do just that. And I like that the series starts out with a practical guide too, right? Because you can get so theoretical, it's it's not accessible. Right. And even right. for people like me that aren't engineering students, I can sit in one of your class and glean and at least understand the concepts and the principles of what you're describing. And I know for your students, it's like immediate application. They, they have something tangible that they can apply. So I think this is really important work. And um, so let's, um, so I'm so glad you do it. And I think it's a real benefit. And I, and I really love that idea of doing the multimedia. That is such kind of a modern way and, yeah. and there are things mm -hmm. that were just are so much more, um, um, they're so much better illustrated, right? Like when you're probing something or mm -hmm. whatever, if you can to sort of conceptually take that abstract idea and just be able to watch you do it, I think really adds a nice layer mm -hmm. um, of, of practicality, right? Okay, so um, our tech had reached out to me and and they said a new book's coming out um, and you've shared with me, it's not quite out, but it's it's ready for pre-order. Um, and that is called Boganin's Practical Guide to Prototype Breadboard and PCB Design. So tell us about this new book and why you right. decided to tackle this subject matter. So, uh you know, most of the classes that I've been teaching over the last 30 years have been signal integrity, power integrity related, very, you know, starting with um, the, the, you know, high, high performance systems and, and applications. And uh, since I've joined um, the faculty here at CU, um, I think it's about five or six years ago, I started teaching a class on printed circuit board design, but really the kind of the precursor to when you're designing transmission lines, because so many of the mm. products, the examples that we build here, the students build in their projects, don't aren't really high speed. They're you know on the 50 megahertz and below kind of thing, small boards. So transmission lines isn't the most important topic for them, but there are a lot of other really important issues in designing circuit boards that um, I've incorporated in this class about how do you do um, uh, circuit design? How do you read a schematic? How do you identify what components to use? When, mm. when you do a search for a resistor, there are a million different resistors. How yeah. do you choose that one in the million to use? Um, how do you uh, take advantage of a reference design, but make it your own? Because there are too many reference designs that are out there that are wrong or misleading or don't use the best design practice. So so I the class that I put together, it started out as how to use how to design circuit boards using Altium. Um, but I found that even before you're laying out the board and you're connecting, doing the connectivity, you really have to understand circuits and how to read schematics right. and how to create schematics, how to identify the parts, how to 
think about risk management at the mm. beginning of the, the yeah. project so that you can have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. Uh, and, 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 you know, since we, before COVID, we were very hands-on, it was about soldering. And, you know, these kids here uh, that, you know, we get historically that have been coming through, they don't know what solder flux is. And when you're doing, especially lead free mm -hmm. and you don't use solder flux, you make terrible solder joints. Yeah. And I see these kids, I used to see these kids anyway, uh, try to solder wires together with um, uh, lead free solder. And they would turn the soldering up to, you know, 800 degrees Fahrenheit as hot as they get because they weren't able to make good solder joints thinking, oh, it's not hot enough. I get it. And they didn't know about tin oxide and about solder flux. I and see. so, uh, so I, I incorporated in this class a lot of the details, the practical aspects of what does it take to successfully build a prototype as a printed circuit board. And the step to get there, I, I strongly recommend that wherever possible, you build it as a solderless, or at least parts of it, a right. solderless breadboard. So you can do it quickly, you can iterate, you can play around, you can change components, you get a feel for how the circuit behaves. Um, mm. And so this, this course has evolved over the years and, and I wrote the textbook based on the course that starts out from the very basics of uh, uh, what do you have to worry about when you build a prototype to increase your chance of first time success. Right. Um, and so it's, and, and along the way, I realized that, okay, if, you know, a circuit board, a solid spread board, we usually think of designing it for connectivity. It is right. to provide the connections yes. between all the terminals of the components, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the, the most important starting place. And if your product is at a low enough data rate or low enough clock frequency or long enough rise times, the interconnects are transparent. They're right. not going to play a role that you can do it anyway. You can have yes. wires going all over the place. Yep. It'll work. Yep. But when you reach the point where you've got um, rise times that are in the microsecond or less yeah. or tens of megahertz kind of clock frequencies, the interconnects aren't transparent anymore. And, and it's not that they behave like transmission lines, but they have predominantly inductance and mutual inductance. And you have to think about those properties of the interconnects when you do the physical layout, the physical implementation of the interconnects. And so in my class and in this textbook, the new textbook, um, one of the important focuses is about, okay, once you've got connectivity established, then it's all about noise. And the right. two most important noise sources are all related to switching noise. They are the first things that, that is gonna break a system. Switching noise from uh, um, IOs that are switching and crosstalk between the IOs and switching noise in the power rail. And so maybe a third of the book is really an introduction to the signal integrity of switching noise. It's how do you think about it? Where does it come from? And most importantly, how do you fix the problem? How do you design it out for signal routing and for the power distribution? And you know, a large part of the section on the power distribution is about what do decoupling capacitors really do? And what is the problem you're trying to solve with them? And what is the most important design feature in their implementation? Um, and it's all taken from the examples I use in my textbook or in, in the class that I teach, we've incorporated in the textbook. Uh, we've developed a number of specialized circuit boards in, in the class that illustrate some of these principles really well. And I show examples of them in the textbook. So it's really, a precursor to the first book on transmission lines. This is how to think about getting beyond connectivity, and and what are you know these two problems of switching noise, you know switching noise between signal lines. Sometimes we call it ground bounce. That's a very large part of it, and then um, power rail noise. Um, and so it's really a practical guide to how do you design circuit boards for uh, and and solderless spreader boards for connectivity, and then. How do you engineer them to minimize switching noise? So that's, sounds, the, that's the yeah, that sounds amazing. And so, at least in your mind, if you've been teaching these classes, it sounds like this sort of lays the foundation of understanding really practically what's happening. So when you go into sort of the the higher speeds, at least you know what right. you're looking at. 
yeah. you know, or where to know to look for the problems or right. having what those, the problems are yeah, and, what the problems and how are to get and, around them. Right. So and it sounds very sorry. foundational to me. It like is. Found, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I try to avoid is I don't like just throwing out rules, do this, do that. I think it's more important to um, provide some understanding of the fundamental principles so that anybody can understand where those rules come from. And, you know, so much of engineering is a trade-off. And while it's important mm -hmm. to, you know, follow the best design practices, sometimes they conflict with each other or sometimes it's too expensive and you have to be able to do the trade-offs. And to do that, you need to understand the, where these rules come from and what their, what their origin is. Right. So we, we try to provide that foundation, like you said, as well as how it motivates these design guidelines and also some design guidelines that I think are wrong, that are popular in the industry, that don't provide any value and that you shouldn't follow. Uh, so we include that as well in the textbook. Well, and you know, we've talked about this before, but I think that when you know what those principles are, you know when you can bend or break them or like yes. what those consequences might be. But if you don't know what's there foundationally, you're kind of you can get to that situation where you're chasing your tail a bit. Or you're relying on what you know, three well, different experts saying four different things. Yes. What, which which one do you follow? And, yeah. and so this is really hoping to empower our readers to become their own expert. Well, I love it. And I love that you're putting good material out there because as you said, there's some bad ideas that if you're a student, well, you grew up with the internet and you're just going to Google it and whatever Google search yeah. may or may not be you know, with any research you do, what you pulling off the internet may or may not be good. And so I like that you sort of have this solid. Now, does this one also have multimedia in it or is it straight yeah. text? Yeah, it so does. it's the same kind of thing. We have um, uh, embedded videos. I have a lot of examples of, you know, some of these boards that I show the results from. I actually um, bring you into my lab. I've got a little video camera. We're looking at the board, looking at the scope measurement. And I'm pointing out how some of the physical features affect the measurement that we see. I make some changes in the circuit and you can see in real time how that affects the, the measurement that we do. So it's like you said earlier, there are some things that just come across so much better visually and, and yes. you know, with, with that, uh, you know, with, with that video. Um, mm -hmm. And so we try to incorporate that uh, wherever possible in the, uh, along the textbook as well. I love that. I love, I think that's a really impactful way to teach especially these days and i think for younger people particularly yes. they you know they learn almost everything on you yeah. know platforms like youtube so yeah. i think that actually helps um, them with their attention span and, and engaging them and holding them there right as well as their passion for engineering which right. is usually a uh, ever-present thing so uh for our listeners i'm going to put those links uh to Eric's books below in the show notes. So you can go check those out. The second one, the prototype Bogan practical guide to prototype breadboard and PCB design is for pre-order only. Eric is still fixing his. Still uh, putting in his a, commas. Taking, and add, his, adding the comments and commas and changing the witches to that's. Yes. <laughs> so I, have I know very, I have the same problem. Luckily yeah. I have a copy editor at, at that fixes all my commas. I am a comma violator. Yeah, me too. So now I before we leave these two books, I actually have a request of your viewers. Okay. Um, because you know, I I um we're gonna do some more books with our tech and more okay. of these multimedia books. And we got these two planned. We have a list of other books that we're gonna do, but I'm not sure what the next one's gonna be. And so I'm okay. open to suggestions. Um, one of them is a book that compiles all my rules of thumb and um, and little descriptions of each of them and, and how they're used. Okay. Another option is a book on um, hacking interconnects using S parameters. And because um, I've done a lot of webinars on S parameters and how to read S parameters like a book and mm -hmm. how to um, turn S parameters into circuit models by, I call that hacking and matching measurement and simulation of mm -hmm. S parameters. So that'd be another one. Um, 
And then there's another one maybe on um, uh, how to use an oscilloscope. So kind of like a handbook for um, uh, professional, uh, professionals using oscilloscopes. So those are, those are some of the candidate uh, books that I have okay. in the list. Not sure which one I want to do next. And uh, would love to get input from some of your viewers. Um, maybe they have another suggestion for another uh, textbook that they'd like me uh, uh, to pursue next. So let okay. me know. We'll decide in the next month or so. Okay. So you guys can do that by commenting on YouTube. I'll put the three titles in there. And speaking of YouTube, Eric is going to um, talk about something in a minute where we're going to show a video. If you're driving in your car, don't stop and look at the video. Okay. But if you have a chance when you get home or get to your office, you're going to want to check out the video. And when you do that, go to the comments, you know, we'll put up those three titles for you and then you can vote on them. And then I can give that feedback to Eric and you can have a vote on what he comes out with next. So that'd be great. Okay. Um, so Eric, we, we should also mention that you are still the Dean of Signal Integrity, right? Academy. Signal Academy right. Uh, at, at, on the Teledyne LaCroix website. We'll share that. And for our listeners, there's tons, I mean, years of content that Eric has put out on multiple subjects and just so much good, good, good information there. So we'll make sure we put a link to that. And then also in your spare time, because you're not too busy doing astronomy, publishing books, teaching students, uh, you also um, are the editor of Signal Integrity Journal Magazine. Technical editor. Technical editor. Yeah. So um, I also want to give a, a shout out to Signal Integrity Journal. We'll put the link below on that so you guys can go subscribe to their publication, some of the people that I respect the most in this industry are all Eric's uh, buddies and, and friends, and they're all contributors there. So it's really good, good, solid content. Um, now, I have, to, I have to make a confession, Eric, and here comes the YouTube part. So before we record our podcast today, something came up in my email box, and it, it mentioned you know, Signal Integrity Journal, and I opened it up, and there was an article you had written about the turbo and cap relator, and I always feel like the not smartest person in the room when I talk to people like you, but honestly, some of these terms, and I've been around for, you know, 25, 30 years in this industry, I had never heard, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that article, and then I know there's a video that you want to share with our audience. Sure. Yeah. So um, th this is a classic story that every engineer um, should be aware of. And I first learned about, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. And um, there's been a series of videos that have been made about this new widget. The it started out as the encabulator and then became the turbo encabulator and then the retro turbo encabulator. And then most recent version that uh, Dan Bognoff at Keysight came out with was the electro turbo encabulator. Um, and uh, uh, it, it is a classic story of uh, engineering excellence. Um, and I, I like to show this to my students as an example of um, how you can see almost, you can find almost anything on the web um, but you have to, you know, as you said earlier, Judy, you have to apply your own critical reasoning mm -hmm. and critical analysis to it. Uh, so you can't believe everything you see on the web. Absolutely. And so I, I don't want to say too much more about it, but I will mention that. So I, I wrote an article about it because I think it after Dan came out with his little video about the electro turbo and cabulator, I thought that it was very timely to get more visibility on uh, this widget so that more engineers are aware of it. And there's a series of videos I link in the article on the SI Journal that I recommend everybody uh, check out. I go talk about a little bit of the history of the encabulator. And, and I have links to the videos. And there's one video that I want to play for you guys that um, was done by uh, Rockwell Automation. Excellent video that describes the, uh, I think this is the retro encabulator uh, really, really well. 
So um, shall I go ahead and share my screen and we'll, we'll look at the video? Yeah, sure. Are now, okay. are you going to show the article first or are you going to go right into uh, the video? Yeah, I'll show the article. So, okay. so I'm going to share my screen here. So okay. here's Signal Integrity Journal. If you haven't been there, you should definitely visit. Everything is completely free uh, on uh, and accessible. We're peer reviewed. I'm the technical editor. I work with a, a really esteemed group of um, uh, experts in the industry on our editorial advisory board. Uh, we review all the articles. So a lot of content. We've been doing this for over four years. I think it's five years now. Yeah. So we've got a ton of content on here. It's all um, archived. It's all searchable. Um, so definitely check it out. And then, you know, I do articles, you know, once a month or so, or blogs. So here's the piece that I did just um, last month. Uh, your next must-have widget, the Electro Turbo Encabulator. Um, and so, yeah, I go through some of the history of it and some of my involvement in it. And then here is um, uh, the link to one of the, um, uh, the videos about the uh, encabulator. So I'm going to open this up. Here's okay. YouTube. Um, so here, here we'll play it. I'm just going to sit back. It's only two minutes long. Here we go. Here at Rockwell okay. Automation's World Headquarters, research has been proceeding to develop a line of automation products that establishes new standards for quality, technological leadership, and operating excellence. With customer success as our primary focus, work has been proceeding on the crudely conceived idea of an instrument that would not only provide inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal gram meters. Such an instrument comprised of Dodge gears and bearings, Reliance electric motors, Allen Bradley controls, and all monitored by Rockwell software is Rockwell Automation's Retro Encabulator. Now basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of pre-famulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The lineup consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal vanes, so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal Lotus O deltoid type placed in panendermic semi boloid slots of the stator. Every seventh conductor being connected by a non reversible tremi pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the gram meters. Moreover, whenever fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal deplenoration. The retroencabulator has now reached a high level of development, and it's being successfully used in the operation of Milford Trenions. It's available soon wherever Rockwell Automation products are sold. Okay, so this is just a, a small example. I, I think it's a classic every engineer should, should view, um, and I, I, I wish I could perform as well with so much, uh, so many words with such a straight face as, as those presenters. They're, they are my heroes. Well, I think your next book needs to be a glossary <laughs> of terms for the turbo encabulator. So we can decipher that highly technical content <laughs> and thank God you're the technical editor you know, weeding out all the garbage so we really know what's going on. In That's right. We, we spent a lot of time curating and only give you the top shelf stuff out there. That's top shelf. Well, boy, did I learn a lot today. <laughs> I wondered what a turbo encabulator was. And now you know. I know. I know. I can use that now. Yeah. Well, the thank you, Eric, so much for joining us and sharing your your outstanding content with our audience and always being such a fun person to talk to and sharing such good um, resources with the whole engineering community and helping all the, the young ones at CU Boulder be really equipped for the industry, you know, and not just going out with the head full of theory and not knowing how to apply those things. So thanks so much for joining us. Hey, always a pleasure, Judy. Well, I want to um, tell you, our audience about two more things, Eric, before I let you go. One is I, um, the OnTrack team, we went ahead and we launched an Amazon 
on track design community book club, a virtual book club. And the first book we're going to put in there is one of Eric Bogatin's. And so what we'll do is we'll take books that we know are solid um, and we will put those in that basically uh, book club for you. I'll share the link below in the show notes. So come over and join, make suggestions of books and let's put good solid content in there and it'll be a good place to share information and kind of vet, vet the good stuff from people like Eric Bogatin, Rick Hartley and others and, and put some good reliable resources in there for you. So I hope you'll go over and click through and join our on track book club. And lastly, um, we are in conversations. A lot of you have been asking about Altium Live. By the time this, um, this podcast goes out, we will be announcing that Altium Live is back in person and virtual at the end of January. So I'll put the press release in the show notes below. And um, we haven't yet opened registration, but there'll be some basic information there so you can save the date. So Eric, thanks again. We'll continue to talk and we hope to have you to Altium Live and share some of your engineering. You can do a turbo and cabular demo. <laughs> That's I'll what start, we're going to do. We'll start working on the floor model right now. Okay. All right. You get back to us on that one. All right. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us, Eric. Hey, great chatting with you, Judy. You Bye-bye. too. And thanks to our listeners. We look forward to being with you next week. Make sure you check out the show notes, subscribe, tell Eric about those book titles so he knows which one to, to serve up net at our tech. And we'll see you next week. Until then, remember to stay healthy, stay safe, and always remember to stay on track. Music.